When Moses met God on Mount Sinai, and just before they departed ways with each other, Moses says to God, please show me your glory. In other words, I want to see you. I want to experience you. And I think that's the same thing the skeptics of the world today ask. You know, if God is real, then prove it. Show it to me. But I would argue that every moment, literally every moment, is filled with the glory of God. Here on earth, in our short-lived lives, we do get to experience the glory of God, even if it's in very small ways, I think, every day. He's everywhere. But we just need to tune our hearts and minds in to see it. I see the glory of God every day if I have the right eyes to see it. When I'm at work, I experience it with others. When I'm at home and I look at my cat, I mean my children, uh, I'm seeing a little piece of the glory of God. I see the glory of God when I am with my wife or my parents or my family. When I look at the stars in the night sky, I see God's glory. But maybe the reason why most people don't think they see him is because they also can't answer the question, what is the glory of God? John Piper, a prominent theologian in our time, he says it like this, the glory of God is the holiness of God made manifest. The glory of God is the manifestation of God's greatness, his beauty, his wonder. It is the awe-inspiring result of his mysteries. The glory of God is the effect of his holiness and his infinite nature. In fact, the scriptures write about the glory of God. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Isn't that true? That is true. I certainly think that's true. When I look up at the stars at the, in the night sky or I look at the sunrise or the sunset, aren't we all admiring little pieces of God's glory? For ages, we have looked up at the stars and we have wondered. You know, in our own, in our own lifetime, we've built telescopes like the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope and we've magnified photos in far off galaxies like this one. This is from the recent James Webb telescope. This is a brand new picture of Jupiter. And if I asked you, what do you know about Jupiter? You'd probably say, well, it's the largest planet in our solar system. You'd be right. It's actually 18 times larger than the Earth. In fact, Jupiter is 2.5 times more massive than all the other planets in the solar system combined. In fact, it's so big, you can see it without a telescope if you know where to look. And it spins faster than our Earth. Jupiter makes one full rotation every 10 hours. This new picture shows numerous bright white spots and white streaks, which are most likely high altitude cloud tops of condensed connective storms. This picture also shows two of Jupiter's moons, which can be seen in the images to the left. And that's just a tiny sampling because Jupiter actually has 79 moons. Here's another photo. This is the Cartwheel Galaxy. The Cartwheel Galaxy is a lenticular galaxy and a ring galaxy. It's about 500 million light years away. And here's another photo. You know, these are all photographs. They're not doctored in any way. Simple snapshots. You think this could be uh, another photo taken with the James Webb uh, telescope? Nope. This is, in fact, a photograph of human brain cells the little engines in your brain taken by a microscope. So I would, argue, I would argue that even that, right? That, just like a distant galaxy, that is also a manifestation of God's glory. Your body, the structure of your being, your anatomy, your physiology is also a reflection of the glory of God because you are a manifestation of, of his creative genius. You are an example of how he develops beautiful and harmonious structures, animals, creatures in the world. You are a creation. You are a work of art made by God. Habakkuk 2 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, scientists have been increasingly realizing that the universe we exist in 
seems to be a artificial reality. <laughs> Some astronomers speculate that the universe is being artificially projected by black holes. Yeah, uh, because the event horizon of black holes is actually two-dimensional. It's a concept, it's a hypothesis called holographic duality. If you look at this picture, this is an enzyme produced by your body. This is insulin. Those crystals are produced by your body automatically. And to me, that does not look like anything natural, right? It looks drawn. It, it looks so rigid and boxy to be something that just naturally evolved. Insulin is designed by a creative and scientific genius. Nothing could be more obvious, but at the same time, it's intellectually resisted. That's in your body right now, regulating your sugar levels, ensuring the most precise balance to sustain your internal organs and your blood functioning. And what, you know what this picture is? That's you. That's you at three days old. Isn't that crazy? That's someone's baby picture. That was just you after conception. It's just a, a lump of cells, right? Or is it a human life? Whether it's by telescope or microscope, life declares the glory of God. The scriptures say in Revelation 4, Then I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the Spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. For the throne came flashings of lightning and rumbles of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. That chapter, that paragraph right there, that is someone witnessing the glory of God, and they're trying so desperately to tell you what the glory of God looks like. This is what it was like to be in his presence. This is what it was like to be in the throne room, I'm trying to tell you how beautiful, how awesome, how awe-inspiring it was to be in his presence. And in that room, he mentions this incredible th feature, right? He says that in the throne room of heaven, there's a rainbow. A rainbow. And he says it probably, you know, maybe it looked like this, right? And, and okay, what if, you know, I asked you about Jupiter a second ago. What, what if I asked you what a rainbow was? And, you know, as a child, it used to be something that you would stare at and dream about. In Sunday school, you, told, you were told it was a sign from God. It was a visible manifestation of a promise that God had made. And then in school, they told you that it was a multicolored arc that was made by light striking water droplets, and that scientifically, it's not even real. <laughs> a rainbow is an optical illusion. It doesn't even exist in a specific spot in the sky, the appearance of the rainbow depends on where you are standing and the sunlight. Thank you, science, for ruining the magic, right? They, they always seem to do that, don't they? They try to find some way to take some reason to take wonder and joy out of life. They try to explain everything away until you and I we're just sacks of meat, and, and rainbows aren't real, and the universe is just a projection made by black holes. Don't get me wrong. Science is wonderful in how it can help analyze our world and help make our lives easier, but when science moves into the area of philosophy and they start trying to define the meaning of, a li of life, it, it really fails to thrill me. Sorry, science, but the rainbow is a reflection of God's glory and his promises. It's not even his greatest creation. Nope, his greatest creation, his most wonderful manifestation of his glory was his son. Hebrews says, he is the radiance of the glory of God 
in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And John chapter 1 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus himself is the infinite glory of God. And even within his own presence, he holds the universe together. I couldn't help but think of that scripture when I came along this photo. This is a photo of an optical phenomenon referred to simply as glory. Though scholars debate how exactly this phenomenon forms, it has something to do with the rays of the sun interacting with water particles in the atmosphere. Yet, maybe it gives us another glimpse of the idea of what it means that Jesus Christ holds the universe together by his power. You know, it's interesting how scientists tend to make discoveries that support the word of God. In fact, scientists in the past 20 years have discovered this. This is the Higgs boson particle. It's a particle that literally holds the universe together. And it allows for mass. And as you can imagine, this quickly got the nickname the God particle. Indeed, the natural world is full of magnificent sights that do fill us with awe and amazement. This is a photograph of Grand Prismatic Spring. It's the largest hot spring in the United States. It's simply amazing. In fact, as I gathered these pictures together for this sermon, I I found myself increasingly haunted by the fact that despite them all being representatives of creation, whether you're looking at a galaxy or you're looking at a brain cell or you're looking at a, a rainbow or a hot spring, the thing that kept coming through my mind was how similar in aesthetics they all were, as if they were all designed by the same consciousness, the same artist. Our job today, tomorrow, every day, is to be more like Jesus and to live for Jesus. You know, Jesus being number one, and in so doing, we become just like the sun and the moon and the stars and nature and animals and the cells in our body because we are all manifestations of God, just like the rainbow. We are called to reflect the light of the Son of God. In fact, when we are saved and reborn by Jesus Christ, our Lord, he actually comes and lives within us and we become his hands and feet. Colossians says to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What? What is the glory of God? Well, God makes his glory known through creation, yes, and we see that God makes his glory known through Christ. Christ in us. Listen to Paul's prayer for us in Ephesians. He says, According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. And you know, even though our own yellow dwarf star is huge, and the universe is huge, and Jupiter is huge, (laughs) combine that with everything being made by God, who is beyond our understanding, it is still God's desire that we know him, that he dwells in our hearts. So how do we do that? Well, I want, to give you, I want to give you five ways. Five ways that we can bring more glory to God. And the first is when we worship him. When we worship him. 
You know, over the years, I've read many definitions of what worship is, but by far the most accurate, most complete one I found is one that was written by author Louis Giglio. He wrote it in his book, The Air I Breathe. And so I'm going to use that definition this morning. Here's Giglio's definition of worship. He says, worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who he is and what he has done, expressed in the things that we say and the way that we live. He says, worship is our response to God. In other words, we don't initiate worship, God does. He reveals and we respond. He discloses and we respond. He unveils and we respond. That is why we come here. That is why you come here. That is why we want you to come here, to worship, because he initiates. You know, some come to church to prepare for the week ahead. But what about coming to thank him and worship him for the week you just lived? He chooses each day to show us how amazing he is in this universe and in our own health and in our own wellness. And we respond and we worship and we say, God, you are amazing. Second, we bring glory to God by loving others. Why? Why do we, why do we love others? Hasn't that question crossed your mind from time to time? Do we love others because they are attractive? Do we love others because they make us laugh? Do we love others because they make us feel good? Do we love others because they're good cooks or they provide some sort of service for us? Why do we love others? In fact, why bother wasting your time getting to know other people at all? Why does the Word of God tell us to love others? The Bible tells us why. We love because God is love. We love because God loved us. We love because if we love others, then God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Isn't that what the word of God says? We love others because God is love. You know, some churches in our area right now, they are struggling with their denomination and they're worried about their future. Other churches struggle with attendance, others with money, and you have a board. Our church has a board that meets once a month to ask and wrestle the, with these tough questions, but the only successful way to build a church is with love. Love builds the church. Programs aren't gonna build a church. A nice building isn't gonna build your church. A beautiful sign out front is not gonna build your church. Advertising in a newsletter is not gonna do it. Money is not the answer. Events aren't gonna do it. Mailing flyers home is not gonna do it. All those things kinda help, but they are not enough. One thing and only one thing builds the kingdom of God, and that's love. In fact, we gotta stop worrying about the influence of the world on us. You know, if Jesus Christ isn't more powerful than the world, then I don't want to serve him. Our lives have to be so saturated with the love of God that it just simply oozes out of us. And we have to love others so much that we're willing to get our hands dirty in the world. Third, we bring glory to God by becoming more like his son. You know, God has great plans for you. But first, you've got to be willing to grow up because life isn't just about believing in Jesus. It's about the life of Jesus radically infiltrating your life. God is not looking for exceptional people, so don't worry. He's not looking for people that are perfect. He's looking for people who are available, willing, followers, it's about following where God wants to take you in this world and for what God wants to accomplish in the world. He wants to radically invade your life and then your life will follow Jesus and it'll accomplish God's work. That's the purpose that God has made you for. That means you're his disciple. Because if all you're doing is just coming down here on the weekend 
to get fed spiritually, and that's the extent of your growth for the week, you're not going to get the nourishment that you need. I oversaw a funeral for a 90-year-old man a few weeks ago. And let me tell you, your death will not be the greatest tragedy of your life. Your greatest tragedy will be dying and having lived below the purpose for which God called you. Living below and missing out on the blessing that comes with that. We need to be more like Jesus. Fourth, we bring glory to God when we serve each other with our gifts. You were wired with the need for others and others are wired for the need for you. So we need to learn to serve each other. I heard of two very extreme churches. The first church gave its new members nine weeks to find a ministry, or they told them, you should probably go to another church. The second example was a church that sent out a typed letter to their 8,000 members and said, serve, volunteer, and give financially, or find somewhere else to attend. Service in the Bible is the word diakonoi, which is where we get our word deacon. It simply means servant, or service, or ministry. Deacons in the Bible were men and women with the gift of service, and they would do routine tasks around the church, in the community. Those with this gift enjoy little-noticed, behind-the-scenes tasks, and they do them cheerfully. Ministries that have service-gifted people are usually the things that have to get done so that things can operate well. Media, music, yard cutting, cleaning, teaching, volunteering, decorating for Christmas, committee work, and other similar ministries. They're all outlets for people who feel called to be a deacon, to be a minister. You know, at our church we say, Every member is a minister. Nobody's off the hook. 1 Peter 4 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So everyone has a gift. And if everyone has a gift, then everyone should have a ministry. That prospect is actually kind of exciting to me. I mean, I don't even know what that would look like. What would that look like? Can you picture a church where every ministry has way too many volunteers? And giving is just too much. And too many disciples are being made. What would that church do? They'd have to start new ministries just to give everybody something to do. That would be a nice problem to have. Last, we bring glory to God when we tell others about him. Friends, just like God expects all of us to use our gifts, likewise, God expects all, yes, all, of his children to share the truth about him. God expects all of his people to open their mouths and to tell others who Jesus is. God expects us to share the truth of the gospel with the people that we meet, with our family, with our friends, with the people that we love. And the gospel is Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven through which people can be saved. And we should not, we cannot, stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. The most important conversation you could ever have with another person is the gospel. The good news is the only news. It's the only real news the world needs to hear, that Jesus loves them, died for them, and they have to repent and place their trust in him, that they'll be forgiven and then assured a place in heaven. How many times have you actually had that conversation with another person? How many times have I had that conversation with another person? 
You want me to tell you how many? The answer is probably the same for both of us. Not enough. Right? Not enough. None of us spend enough time telling others about Jesus. None of us. The command Jesus gave his disciples in Acts 1.8 is also a command to each of us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As disciples, we are called to share the truth. We are called to be salt and light. We are called to open our mouths. We are called to serve God. We are called to be witnesses. We are called to be witnesses because the universe is a witness. Remember the very first verse I read, Psalm 19.1, for the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens never stop sharing, never stop telling, never stop displaying the glory of God. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, all glory in heaven and earth belong with you. We come before you into the throne room underneath the rainbow, surrounded by the thrones, and we fall on our faces and we worship you. Glory be to God forever and ever. Lord, you are great. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty. You are heavenly Father, Lord of Lord, Lord of hosts, King of kings, Prince of peace, mighty one. Lord, just as the sun, the moon, and the stars reflect your glory, so we, your children, are also called to be a reflection, to be a manifestation, to be an example, a representative of your glory. May we continue to serve you by loving you, by worshiping you, by loving these brothers and sisters, the people of this world, by having no enemies, by ministering and serving not just your church, but the world, and to spread the gospel, to share the truth of Jesus Christ. May we never stop telling, never stop sharing, never stop loving, and never stop revealing your glory. Thank you for this week. Go with us in the week ahead. In your son's name, amen. Hey, thank you for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Of course, we want to remind you that we are here. We are a church. We are local. We are in Montgomery. We are the church where you live. Please uh, attend one of our services. We have two. Uh, we have one at 930, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing all of your favorite hymns. We have responsive readings. We take communion. We say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to be everything that you remember from church growing up. And then our second service is at 11 o'clock. We have a worship band. Please come relaxed, come as you are. We also have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we have a youth group that meets every Wednesday. And your children don't have to attend here on Sunday to attend on Wednesday. Please send your kids over on their skateboards or their bikes every Wednesday at 5.30. We'll even feed them dinner. We'll have a time of games and they'll leave with an important lesson. We'll send them home to you in about two hours. Hey, I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.